Namaste. So, for the last few days, I haven't posted any videos. And the reason for that is I've been thinking about how to uh, continue the topic I started in the last video about intentional suffering, conscious suffering, tapasya. And <laughs> it's not coming together in my head. And the reason it's not coming together is uh, because of the uh, extreme social prejudice against certain concepts and methods that are uh, integral, even a core part of the practices that I'm doing. It doesn't make much sense, I know. But the last time we talked about Kadoshka and the sun dance, and this time I want to talk about Shaolin Da Mo Muscle Changing Qi Gong. Muscle Changing Tendon Strengthening Qi Gong was developed by Da Mo, also known as Bodhidharma. And uh, he was in charge of training the monks at a certain little monastery, you might have heard of it, Shaolin. <laughs> Very famous monastery because of their martial arts, right? But what is the basis of that martial arts? Energy. And they have an energy science called Qigong. Qigong. So, if you practice this Qigong, you learn automatically how to transmute intense sensation of any kind into pleasure. Okay? It's an energy art, an energy skill, which is why it comes under internal martial arts in India. So, <laughs> so strange how this happened that through friends, I got into a class taught by a Taiwanese lady, 83 years old, could whoop any guy in the room, seriously. And uh, she's teaching Qigong, and she's also teaching this other thing called the, the Yellow Emperor. And this is wild. This is like Chinese Tantra. So what they're doing is they're using the same toughening techniques, huh? the same intense sensory stimulation, or a very similar program as used by the Navajo and other Indian tribes to, to prepare the warriors, right, future warriors. The Chinese are using very, very similar, uh, actually the same in principle, only different in the details of the application for the particular time and place. But otherwise, virtually identical from an energy level. So, <laughs> I think at that time I received a seed, which later on grew up and uh, bore fruit in the uh, uh, path realizations. Because the lady who taught was also the wife of a very famous Zen master. See, Chinese Zen masters can be married, which I think is cool. It means they have an awareness of this tantric side of the energy work, uh, which if you go deep into it, you'll have to discover. Now, the thing is, I discovered these techniques on my own when I was a kid, 10, 12 years old, okay? This is what I haven't brought out. These techniques came to me, like, through intuition, through listening to my body, my body saying, do this, hold this yoga pose for 15 or 20 minutes and see what happens. Ow, it hurts. Right? <laughs> Sit in any meditation posture, any of the asanas, 
lotus, half lotus, or even easy posture. Just sit there, don't move at all for 20, 25 minutes, right? And how stiff is your body? How, how painful is, are your legs and hips and stuff like that? Huh? How much of an impact does it have on you actually? So every time we see a statue of, of, of a sage, a Hindu sage, a Buddhist sage, doesn't matter. They're always sitting in one of these postures. What does it mean? Conscious suffering, intentional suffering. Huh? Do you think you're the only person in the universe whose legs hurt when you sit like that? No. Everybody with a human body is like that. So it means they were voluntarily taking pain to achieve something higher. And what is that higher? The higher means changing our relationship with sensation and perception such that we take responsibility for deciding what is pleasure and what is pain. See, as far as the body is concerned, there is only sensation. Pleasant and unpleasant is from the mind. And yeah, it's based on the past and all kinds of conditioning and whatnot. But the Buddha said the best thing is to see everything as neutral. So how can you see everything as neutral if the whole society is biased towards chasing pleasure and avoiding pain? See? Nobody wants pain, everybody wants pleasure. Huh? I think the corporation is a wonderful symbol of that because the corporation, its only purpose is to increase the value of its shares. <laughs> it's so disconnected from reality. So <laughs> similarly, a person whose only objective in life is to chase pleasure is going to suffer when they encounter pain. And guess what? It doesn't matter where you draw the line between pleasure and pain. Your life is going to be on both sides of it. <laughs> so what to do? What to do? Well, what if there is a way to learn how to transmute what we would call pleasure, a pain, into pleasure? Or at least make it neutral. And it turns out there is. And that's what these arts are all about. And that's why it's not a coincidence. Huh? The night birds are coming up. It's not no coincidence that these arts were kept alive by marshals, martial artists, fighters, warriors, people who encounter pain on an everyday basis. If you've ever done any martial arts training, it's owie. <laughs> you have to block and everything. And everything hurts. It's like, ah, <laughs> why am I doing this? Well, you're doing it so that when it happens in a real fight, you'll be able to get through it. So <laughs> the whole point of it is then in training for life. How do you get through those rough spots? How do you get through the unavoidable displeasurable, you know, or suffering. Suffering is coming according to karma. Everybody's got karma coming because of what they did in their past life and whatever. But what about if one could choose one's suffering? Wouldn't that make it a whole lot better than being at the mercy of forces like karma and fate and destiny and all of that. Wouldn't it be better if you could choose your pain? Well, you can. That's what Kadoshka is all about. That's why when a young brave goes out in the wilderness, or two or three in a small band, and they do these exercises involving physical pain, it's done as a sacrifice for the benefit of the tribe. They say, well, so much pain is coming to the tribe on my account. 
So I have to get out here and experience it so that I don't lay it on the whole tribe. And similarly, the Chinese martial artists, you know, they're going, well, from a Buddhist point of view, it's just sensation. So I should be able to stand back from it and not judge it, whether it's painful or pleasant. I should be able to just, you know, let it happen, let it go by and note it, but not get involved in it. See? And, and the fact, you know, the fact is that attitude leads to something. It's not an end in itself. It's only kind of a hoop that you have to jump through to get to this other thing, which is even better. <laughs> and what's that? Algo lagnia. Algo lagnia is, I think, a psycho, psychological term, meaning when something painful that, or that is ordinarily considered painful is perceived as pleasant. And so, of course, psychology is always looking on the dark side. They treat it as a disorder, right? And, of course, it's linked with S&M and all of these uh, really dark kind of negative things, magic with a K, you know, and all this. So uh, some people have discredited it, right? But this sexual tantra that involves extreme sensations, is not just, you know, something that Dracula does on his day off. This is something that comes from a long ancient tradition in several different cultures. I've seen it in Micronesia too. In Micronesia, oh my God, they go out on the ocean in these little, little kayaks practically, you know? These little boats made from a, a, a tree trunk a coconut tree trunk, outriggers. And they go out routinely for like a week or two, you know. <laughs> How do they do it? Well, there's a whole mystery school. There's a whole uh, like uh, apprenticeship program called the Longhouse. If you want to be a, a navigator or a captain or even an ordinary fisherman, you have to go through longhouse training. And longhouse training is basically organized homosexuality. <laughs> They're not just looking at the stars out there on those canoes at night. Uh, so it's a long-standing tradition in the Micronesian Polynesian societies that the boys go into these longhouses and they get trained in all the manly arts of love. Okay. That just try to put your Judeo-Christian, monotheistic, linear, two-valued uh, logic and morality aside for a second. And look at the fact that in the different cultures around the world, there have been radically different standards of right and wrong. Uh, and, and that this is such a case, uh, and that it has fallen into a black hole of neglect and condemnation in our society uh, because of some religious scholars, I don't know, hundreds of years ago. Why do we still follow them? Huh? So anything that even looks like uh, the, the Inquisition, right? Or the Holocaust or whatever, uh, things people latch on to, you know, and cling to. Anything that even looks like that is automatically rejected. But what I'm saying is to put that judgment aside and look at this Kadoshka and look at this Shaolin Chi Kung, you know, and look at this Micronesian longhouse training as a, a way for people to be able to do things they would not be able to do without it. You would not survive 30 seconds in a medieval Chinese battlefield without this Qigong training. Uh, it's called the iron shirt. The iron shirt, it makes like an armor of energy around your whole torso. You're, you're invulnerable 
to any kind of blunt force attacks. Handy thing to have in a battle, isn't it? Well, <laughs> so we have, we got initiated in that line. Actually, we discovered those techniques. I personally discovered those techniques spontaneously when I was a kid, 10, 12 years old. And now I'm also offering them to anybody who wants to come and study with me. So we have to talk, right? <laughs> Drop me an email or uh, ask how you can get in touch. Om Tat Sat. Budu Saranai. <laughs>